Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Within the fragments that we possess of the work on nature of the great pre-Socratic thinker Heraclitus, one of the themes, which is a rather paradoxical one if we, if we think it out, that comes up as, as central is what we might call the contrast between harmony on the one hand and discordance, disagreement, disharmony on the other hand, taken far enough into opposition to be actual war or fighting. Now, with any collection of fragments like this, we could really begin at any place, and so it's somewhat arbitrary, my choice of which fragment to begin with, but I think that in order to put this into perspective, it might be best to look at fragment 80, and that's using the deals numbering, first. So he tells us that um, one should know, and the, the Greek terms there we're going to come back to in just a moment, are eid and I re, that war is common, that strife is justice, and that everything arises and is lacking, and we'll talk about alternate translations there, through strife. So this is a, a rather blanket statement covering a lot. It's, it's saying that one ought to know something about the nature of the universe, about the nature of human relations, about reality, perhaps even about oneself. So he says that war is common, and war there is polemos. Some people try to translate that as a sort of principle of antagonism carried out in any way. But I mean, war as Polemos, um, he, he, he might be suggesting that everything is at war in some way or another. And it's good to remember that this doesn't mean that we have a war of all against all necessarily, because when you do have a war, you don't have everybody on one side fighting each other. You have them fighting everybody on another side, although there may be some conflicts within there. So he says that war is common. Common not in the sense of, you know, something that we commonly run across, but xunon here, which is kind of an old fashioned term by the time that we get to, to more modern Greek writers. Uh, and by modern, I mean more <laughs> ancient, but, but less ancient than Heraclitus. Um, it's, it's something that binds things together. So to say that it's common doesn't just refer to its ubiquity. It refers to the fact that it is something that peoples have in common. Strife, eris, uh, another term for a discordance, uh, actually turned into a goddess. You might, you might remember eris giving the apple as part of the start of the Trojan War. Um, strife is justice, dike. So what is that supposed to mean? Well, in some respect, and, and there's another fragment that I think helps to bring this out, it means that you don't actually have justice just by itself in the universe, everything going along swimmingly. You get justice by imposing justice, by having sides contesting against each other, making rival claims, saying this is justice, no, this is justice. And what you're doing is wrong. No, what you're doing is wrong. And sometimes having to come to blows about it or to submit it to uh, a judge. Now, this other part, everything arises. Another translation 
for this is everything happens in accordance with strife and necessity. Now, the term there, chreomena, okay, that, that could be translated as things that are necessary because chreo gives us the chre, which means it is necessary. By, that, by the time of Heraclitus, that's already sort of a common Greek uh, way of using that, that verb. And, but it also does have the sense of being something that is, that's not there, that ought to be there, something that is lacking. And I think that fits really well with the everything that arises, or another way of translating that, everything that happens, uh, genomenai, um, it's this, this dynamic verb, and then everything that's, that's missing. All of that happens in, in accordance with or through strife, katerin, right? Um, so what we've got here is something that a person, if they want to be one of the wise, really needs to know. If they want to be one of the dummies, the, the many, according to Heraclitus, who don't really know anything and just kind of wander around doing things at random, saying and, and doing you know, uh, foolish things that, that uh, could, they could be doing differently, then don't worry about this. But if we want to really understand reality, then we need to, to take a look at this, according to Heraclitus. <clears throat> now, I mentioned there's another really important passage, and this is um, fragment 53, one of the most famous ones of Heraclitus, I think, where he says, War is father of all and king of all. So war has this superlative status. Why? He gives some reasoning for this following this. He says, some war reveals as gods, others as human beings. Some war makes slaves, others free. So there's a revelatory capacity to war, to polemos, to this, this striving against each other, this agonism or antagonism, if you like. So these, I think, go together. Um, in order to understand things, we have to see what the conflict of forces against each other reveals to us, rather than just taking things you know, on the basis of their names or preconceived notions. And I think there's a really interesting example of how this works in a cosmological and also to some degree, I guess you could say theological way in um, the passage where um, he's talking about the sun, how the sun does not overstep its, its bounds. Why not? Here we go. This is in uh, Deal's fragment 94. The sun will not overstep, and it's literally the word is, is, you know, got binone, stepping in it. It won't overstep its measures. And measures here are, you know, quite literally metra. The sun has its ordained place, and it won't overstep it. Why not? Because if it does, it's going to provoke conflict, and it's going to run into the furies who are allies, epikuroi, another way of translating that, mercenaries or you know, retainers or whatever, of DK, of justice. So justice, if the sun gets out of line, if the sun does more than it ought to, like goes too close to the earth or decides it wants to sleep in one day or something like that, then the furies are going to get after it. And the furies are, you might say, they're very much in, in, in alignment with Eris, with strife, right? They are the ones who come in and stir stuff up and impose, inflict upon others. So I think that's, that's enough about that sort of cosmic process and principle. Another thing that Heraclitus gets uh, talked about quite a bit for is this metaphor of the harmony that is involved in the lyre or the bow. So a bow, I think everybody is familiar with that. You know, you have a, a string and you have a uh, wooden piece, could be composite back then, probably not. And you pull it back and 
it's, it's two forces that are, you could say, in harmony with but also differing from each other. And you use it to propel an arrow, which then uses the force of both of them and, you know, shoots out against an enemy or hunts something or maybe you're doing target practice, whatever it happens to be. A lyre is a musical instrument. And the Greek lyre was kind of bow-shaped. And I think you've seen images of them, and it had the thing across the top, and then you had all these strings that you would tighten up. And the strings themselves are in a scale, which is it played in certain ways can give you harmonies. Now, typically they would pluck the lyre. They weren't playing chords all at the same time. They're playing what we typically would call today arpeggios, but it's still the same idea. And he tells us, this is in fragment 51 in Deals, that what we have with the lyre or the bow is a back-turning harmony. And the word he uses for harmony there is the one that we transliterate, harmonie. And back-turning, palentropos. What does it mean to be a back-turning harmony? And how, how do you have a harmony with a bow? So harmony here doesn't just mean musical harmony. It means some sort of accordance. It means some sort of things balancing each other out and producing something else as a process, whether it's the musical notes or the arrow flying or whatever. whatever. It, we could have all sorts of other examples. Why is it a, a back-turning harmony? Well, he tells us that what people don't recognize and the word that he uses there in Greek is um, from the verb um, meaning to, to understand, to, to, to recognize, to see. Uh, they don't recognize that there's two things going on at the same time. And here's where it gets quite paradoxical. We have a tending away is how it's translated, but the Greek is actually diaferomenon. The word that we get differing, difference from later on, right? The diaferomenon would be the thing that differs from something else. And, but, it, but literally it does mean tending away or being carried away, right? Um, but it's also in agreement, homologe, right? So how can a thing both be tending away and or differing and also in agreement well like the lyre or the bow so these are being used as metaphors for how you know the cosmos works how human relations work and what this means is that we can talk about on the one hand difference and discordance particularly that of fighting and war and also harmony as not being entirely disharmonious with each other. So we might say that there's an even greater overarching, whatever we want to call it, harmony, connection, some sort of principle uniting these together. And that's difficult to wrap our heads around, difficult to think. This is a, a paradox indeed. The other thing that he says that's particularly interesting about this is not in that passage. It's in uh, fragment 54, where he talks about harmonies as being um, non-apparent and apparent, meaning harmonies that we readily see as harmonies and harmonies that are to some degree concealed. We have to look into them. Uh, so afanes and phaneron are the two terms that he's using there. And those come from the word to, to actually appear to, to somebody. So what's really interesting here is that he uses a, another term, a, a value term, krechon. And this is a very common value term in Greek. And it's, it's rather polysemous. It has multiple meanings. It can mean better, as in you know, superior in value but it can also mean more powerful than. And I think in the time of Heraclitus, we can make a good argument that he's actually playing on both of these. And we might say, well, non-apparent harmony is not just better in some sense, maybe aesthetically or in terms of grasping things intellectually, but also ontologically or metaphysically is more important, more prior. 
so that even in the war, we can see some sort of non-apparent harmony going on in that as well. Um, there's a few other things to say about this, this theme. One is that he notes an interesting function to discordance, to a lack of harmony, which might conceal a, a, a you know, non-apparent harmony. So one thing that he, he tells us, and this is in fragment uh, 111, is that contrasts make things seem pleasant or good. And he says um, that, here we go, uh, he precedes this in 110 by saying it's not better for men to get everything they want, um, literally everything that they, they choose, everything that they, they plan for themselves, thelane. Why? So he says, disease makes health pleasant. He doesn't actually say, as, it, as the translation here says, pleasant and good, because the next thing that follows is bad good, literally. Kakon agathon. So it could be read as a general principle that the bad leads us to recognize the good. So disease makes health pleasant, meaning like when you're no longer sick, you're like, oh man, I feel so good right now. I could go do a, a million different things, right? And we can say this about other things as well that he gives as examples. Um, hunger makes, you know, being full pleasant or good. Uh, weariness makes rest, similarly, pleasant or good. So what do we have here? How does this tie in with strife and harmony and all that? Well, you know, the fact that we have these opposites allows us to recognize the better thing as the better thing. He also says something kind of funny that, you know, maybe fits in with the, the way it works for the many, but even the wise as well, that blows drive animals to pasture. Going to pasture is not something automatic for sheep or goats or cattle. You actually have to drive them to go out there. And blows could be something within um, strife. You could look at what the shepherd does is not this, this wonderful, harmonious pastoral thing. But if you've ever handled animals, you know that things often don't work that way, right? The last thing I want to bring up is a very famous passage, an enigmatic passage that is often quoted in discussions about anger by Heraclitus. And it's often translated using the term anger. Here's, here's a common translation of it uh, in, in this one. Um, here we go. Uh, the reason it is hard to fight against passion is that it buys what it wants at the expense of the soul. So passion, anger, both of them are ways of translating the, the Greek term thumos, which was felt literally here in the chest. Homer uses this term quite a bit. Uh, Achilles has to master his thumos in order to not you know, kill Agamemnon where he stands. And this, this gets discussed by Plato, who turns it into a part of the soul by Aristotle, who makes it one of the main kinds of desire or affectivity. Literally what Heraclitus says is a lot more straightforward. Thumos machasthai halapon. Um, thumos is that, that drive, whatever we want to call it. Machasthai is the word to fight against, tied in with battle, polemos, right? Tied in with strife. Machasthai um, is, is sort of a, a term that signifies a conflict within the person. You feel what your thumos wants. And he actually uses the term thumos wanting something, right? Um, and he says it's difficult, halapon, uh, a hard thing to do. It's a difficult thing to do to struggle against one's own anger desire. Why? Because what it wants, it will purchase even at the cost of one's life. It will throw one into the battle. So we come full circle. Thumos is part of this, and Heraclitus is noting that this, this part of ourselves, we might actually want to bring it under control, so we're not the ones who are willy-nilly fighting battles, but rather choosing the battles that we want to fight, and perhaps 
along lines that produce some non-apparent harmony. So this is a very rich theme, well worth exploring. Obviously, if we had more of Heraclitus' fragments, there might be more to say about this, but that's, that's what we've got for the time being.